All right. Hello, everybody. It's uh, Monday, April 6, 2020, beginning of week four of the coronavirus shutdown. And I want to talk today about uh, where we are with the models and going back to work. So these two images I um, took off of Twitter. Someone had tweeted out. I, I prefer to keep them anonymous for now, but someone had tweeted out. Uh, this is a some information supposedly given out by Andrew Cuomo, where 16,000 people are hospitalized currently in New York. Now, this was as of April 5th in the morning, so this could really be April 4th data. Uh, and 4,376 ICU patients. And then they did a screen capture of the IHME model showing that we were going to need 69,000 beds in New York. So now that would be the whole state of New York, but by far the, the cases are in New York City. Um, and again, I don't know if this is New York State or New York City, but the numbers are way, way different. Okay, so we only have 16,000 hospitalized, and the model was predicting 69,000. Okay, and for ICU beds, they were predicting 12,000. And Cuomo's showing only 4,000. So the message of the tweet was, bad day for the model. Uh, it's performing poorly. Bad, bad model. And I guess you can say that, but it very much misunderstands models. So anyone, and I've said this before, anyone who thinks that the numbers that are being presented, the 100,000 to 240,000, the 1.5 million to 2, you know, those numbers or the numbers in this IHME model are highly accurate, are highly mistaken. OK, these are tools. So we are in a position where and again, this is the exact same tool that's being used. Now, not the same models, but the same type of tool that's being used to tell us all of our climate change science, all the predictions that are talking about what it's going to be like and why we need to take action now. They're models, okay? They're much more complicated models because there are a lot more variables that we don't know about. They project over a much longer period of time. So you take everything that you know with the studies and, and data from the past and the present and everything that you believe you understand about an issue and you build a model around it. And you input numbers, and it helps you predict what's going to happen. Weather is similar to this as well. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, but this is models, okay? This ought to be a kind of eye-opener as far as how we engage the climate change debate as well. But, you know, any scientist who uses these models, uh, well, especially in, in real time, any, sci any scientist on these models that we're using today, and you've seen some of them cast doubt on how they're being used and such, I would say they're not being presented improperly. I would say they're being reported improperly. But, uh, okay, so we do the best we can at predicting what's going to happen, and then we update it as we go along. And when we update, putting in new actual real numbers may change the prediction, but also hopefully uh, as new information comes in, they change the algorithms and how things are weighted and used and such in the models. So let's take a look at where we're at today. Um, by the way, go back to that just for a second. Okay, this was over the weekend, right? 63,000 beds, um, I'm sorry, 76,000 needed, and 11,782 ICU beds and 9,000 ventilators. So where are we today? We are at uh, New York, 25,000 beds needed. Oh, it came down by a factor of a third, or to a factor, to a third. And ICU at beds needed only half of what they were predicting before. 
Why? Because we've updated the model, okay? And, you know, it depends on how you want to approach it. Can you, you can look at this and say, the models were garbage all along, we wasted our time, but that wouldn't be very intelligent because you can't take out the fact that we've done all the social distancing and the mitigation that they're talking about. So, on one hand, yeah, I'm sure the models were not 100% accurate. I mean, you know, one thing, I don't. I, I kind of think if they use data from China, I know they used Italy and some of the other countries, but if they use data from China, I kind of think they should just throw it out because I personally believe that bad data is worse than no data. So uh, not knowing what we can believe about what happened, how many how many people infected, this and and how many people died, all that, not being able to to trust the numbers coming out of China, I would leave them out. But at any rate, the models today look much much better. Okay. Um, I wish I had saved more screen grabs, but you can see that in New York, we're pretty much down to almost zero by May 1. Very, very good news, okay? Look at the deaths per day in New York. Well, let's, let's switch back to United States. So everything has changed. They updated this model. And again, I would say, I would argue that the, the biggest takeaway from the updated model is that, you know, the... the Efforts we're taking are doing more. They're actually having a more positive impact than they uh, had anticipated. I guess you could say that, the, you know, take the other side of it and say, well, their predictions were probably off too. But the reality of it is we've done this social distancing and we have no way to go back now and say, well, let's see what it would have been like if we didn't. Well, we may. We may have another opportunity coming and I'll tell you about that. So, uh Okay, we're still not on a, on a national level down to zero until June, okay? But you can even see that the upper limit, lower limit, the envelope, if you will, before it was a nice kind of smooth, sort of followed the, the, the mean curve here and uh, no longer, okay? So in my opinion, we're getting a little better. The model is getting better and we're also performing better. Uh, as a society. So you can see, remember, we had really nice, smooth projections in the model, and we see more staircase things going on here, because that's reality. Reality doesn't look nice and smooth like this, okay? it's it's There are too many variables. And the overall death rate, which was at 93,000, is now down to 81,000. With the you know the upper limit was it 180? It's now about 135 on the on the upper end. So we're doing it, okay? We're doing a lot better. We're performing better. Now, here's a problem I, I've been having. I plan to track. Uh, what do you track here? Okay. How, how can you follow this and get a sense of what's going on? Because the White House is not revealing any more info on their models. And uh, I, I can explain why. I will explain why in another video. But. Uh, I personally concluded that deaths were the best thing. Now, they're lagging. OK, because we have new cases coming up and then people get infected, they get sick. So they're you know, they're not going to die for a period of time. So even though uh, the, even if the infection rate is coming down, the deaths will still be maybe going up, maybe kind of holding where they are, that sort of, sort of thing. So, um, yeah, deaths are a lagging indicator, as Fauci keeps saying. But it's hard data. OK, it's the most accurate number that we have. So if you want to track this model or our situation, even though it's maybe a couple of weeks behind, you could track deaths very accurately. Now, uh, Dr. Burks in last night's uh, press conference uh, said something that helped me very much. Uh, the old, OK, how do we know how, you know, as far as spreading of the virus when the more, the, you know, the rising numbers are probably more indicative of the fact that we're doing more tests than the fact that, uh, you know, more people are actually getting infected. She said that they were tracking the positive, the percent positive of the tests that they do. Now, you know, none of these things are perfect. Uh, again, I mean, this is, you know, us doing our best to try to monitor and control something that we really can't can monitor or control very well. So, uh, but at any rate, she gave numbers in New York, New Jersey on the order of 30 some percent 
positive. So of all the tests they take, 30 plus percent of the people are, are positive. I'm, I'm in Pennsylvania and we're kind of middle of the pack there. We're at about 12 percent. And the states that aren't, oh, and I guess New York and New Jersey are, are coming down their percentage where uh, Louisiana is going up. Um, South Florida might be rising. So that's kind of a nice indicator if you track the number of positive. Now, arguably, the more still, the more testing that you do, the more, uh, you know, up until now, we've been very selective about the tests that we do. Only people with really qualified that may highly likely have the virus have we allowed to take the test. So as we expand more testing and we lower our standard, if you will, to allow more and more people to take the test where before they wouldn't have, I mean, that's going to also lower the percentage of positive. So, you know, not perfect, okay, but still much better that so still much better than just tracking the number of of uh, positives taken. Um, so as a percentage of tests taken, percentage positive, that's a much better way of looking at it. So where else are we? Okay, so New York. Um, okay, so Cuomo cited some numbers out of New York, and I wanted to see if I could find a place. And NYC Health, on uh, nyc.gov has this page, and this was as of April 5th, so about the same. It may, the, the numbers Cuomo gave may have been from the 4th or the 5th, but they really said 14,000 hospitalized. So I don't know where Cuomo's getting his number. Uh, maybe you read some of the text here. Maybe there's some hospitals omitted from this. But uh, 14,000 hospitalized, 2,400 deaths. And if you scroll down, now you can see some other. Uh, but if you scroll down and look at the uh, there's some PDF reports here. They're, they're not live graphs, unfortunately, but we could do COVID-19 data daily summary hospitalizations for New York, actually New York City. So that might be the difference. These are the New York City numbers, 14,000, and Cuomo gave us uh, 16,000 might be the entire state. But uh, here we are with New York City, uh, 14,000 hospitalized, 65,000 cases. So where are we? Okay. So that anyway, that so there's a resource that you can use if you like, if you want to try and track New York. And you can look up the same sort of thing uh, you know, for your state or nationally. But if you want to kind of keep a plug, I, I really recommend watching the press briefings. You know, they're kind of long. The amount of information you, know, you maybe you get 10 minutes. If you could really boil it down to 10 minutes, you could get most out of it. And maybe I will start doing some summaries of it. But it, I'm sorry, but the news reporting is just, mm, you know, it's not helpful. I'm, and, and again, I, maybe I'll do a, 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 my kind of recap of the Sunday night's press briefing. I'll show you what I mean. But for example, if, if you were on Twitter and you were following these guys and they're reputable journalists, but you know, they're not scientists. Okay. They don't, yeah, they think, Oh, bad model, throw it out. Now that would be a bad decision to throw out the model. So, okay. Uh, well, I do want to point out one other thing. So if you look at one thing I noticed poking around last week, if you look at New York, you know, I, what I'm going to show you is we're seeing a little bit of the flatten the curve versus let the curve run faster kind of a thing. So New York has really gotten smaller here. OK, it's well, a, pretty close to zero by May 1. And, you know, because they relative to the number of people that the virus was already spreading in New York before the mitigation took effect. So this is kind of a less of a flattening the curve effect. They tout California as one of the states that did a great job in flattening the curve. And as you can see, okay, it's flat, but it goes farther out. So it's, it sticks around a little bit longer. Uh, Virginia, uh, you know, I don't know the variables as far as when they started mitigation and things, but if you look at Virginia, we're almost at June. So you can, if you, Washington, another, okay, so Washington's in good shape as far as May goes. 
But I, that's just, to me, an interesting thing. If you want to see the impact of flattening the curve versus letting it, letting it run its course, you do, in fact, see, like, in, in the case of New York, New Jersey, you do see the um, cases going away faster. So, a little food for thought. Okay, so... <clears throat> Our, our, we're, we're just crushing our economy right now. I mean, and, and yeah, you know, I'm sorry. You cannot separate the two. You can't just say the economy doesn't matter. That's Wall Street because that is that is so wrong. Okay, and uh, you know there needs to be an economic piece to this. Now, Dana Perino tweeted out over the weekend suggesting that uh, the president start a second task force. Um, made up of a bipartisan committee, industry experts, economist type thing, to work on a plan for going back to work. And Trump actually retweeted that with a comment, good idea, Dana. So that's good. I mean, I, and I, I believe that's a good idea. Uh, if you watch Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci, public health, you know, 100%, we do in fact need to consider at what point you know, we, we can go back to work. So I really hope that he, he looks into that more. Now, I can show you, if I go through the uh, press conference, I can show you that on the task force that he has now, that Trump is that kind of person, okay? Trump is the, the one pushing, if you will, to, you know, turn the economy back on. It's pretty obvious, but I, I might be able to shed some light on some things. But one thing I would suggest you look at, now I haven't read this whole paper, but I've read the abstract. This is analyzing the 1918 influenza outbreak. And looking at some of this influenza data, I believe it's probably informing the models that we're using today as well, in addition to the co coronavirus data that we have. But here is a paper written by economists, okay? Uh, Sergio Carreria, never heard of the guy, but he's supposedly on the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve. Stephen Luck, if that's how you pronounce it, he's part of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And Emil Werner, who is MIT Sloan School of Management. Okay, so basically, they're looking at the flu pandemic of 1918, and based on this abstract, they're saying that the cities that did not intervene uh, had their economy suffer harder and longer versus those that did put in place the mitigation. So here's, an, here's the economists kind of saying that, you know, as far as our economy goes, mitigation's better for the economy than not mitigating so for what that's worth now i don't know and and i you know any of the, the advocates of let's go back to work now are are more kind of a hybrid if you will they're suggesting that we isolate high-risk people and uh you know let the stronger people go back to work but i want to show you another article from our pittsburgh now you may take away from this that Bob is all about shutting down the economy. I am not, okay? I'm just all about presenting accurate information and looking at uh, everything objectively. Here are two, two professors. One's a mathematician from Carnegie Mellon. The other is a professor of, assistant professor of molecular biology at the University of Pittsburgh, okay? You can read this article, Google it, you'll find it. I'll tell you what they're saying. I take a little issue with the headline, and I take a little issue even with their sort of saying the models are wrong. Um, you know, forget the models. If that's the imply, if you read this and you think they're saying forget the models, throw out the models, I don't think that's what they would say if they were asked that question. And even if they did say, yeah, I would disagree with them. Okay, because the models are giving us information. If anything, they're 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 bringing up a point that's not being currently looked at that has been talked about, but in their estimation, deserves much more focus than, than um, anything that would, you know, much more emphasis, I guess. So what they're talking about is a second wave. So basically, they say that um, unless we have a vaccine, that no matter what we do in this first model, if we could be way, way down on the curve, but if we go back to work, we're going to come right back again. And that kind, of, that kind of makes sense. 
it's it's very possible that this uh, virus started with just one or a handful of people in China, and the problem with it is that it spread so rapidly. So it would not take very many cases to restart us on this uh, you know spread curve again. Um, and here's some interesting info. Now, if you go to National Geographic, how some cities flattened the curve during the 1918 flu pandemic, this is a pretty good article. They do ask for your uh, email address, but you don't have to give them. It's not a registration. They just want an email address to read it. And you can put any email address you want in. They don't verify it. So, okay. So we have curves here. And I, I find this kind of useful. So the city with the most deaths per capita um, is Philadelphia with 748 deaths out of 100,000. And I believe that's out of the population. Okay, that's not out of number infected. So basically 0.75% of the population died in Philadelphia. Um, they had the highest raw number of deaths. I'm in Pittsburgh, and hey, Pittsburgh wins. We had the highest death rate, so the highest number of deaths per capita right here in good old Pittsburgh, uh, 807. So 0.807% of the Pittsburgh population died. Uh, that's pretty big. That's a pretty big number. Now, if you look at St. Louis here, okay, and you read, read, and I don't know if this story, but read up on this stuff, they talk about St. Louis did very, they had the early mitigation. They did a really good job. Uh, you know, they were proud of themselves. They were heralded as the model. They went back to work, and then this happened, okay? So we had to flatten the curve, and then the second wave came out more like the, herd immunity curve, if you want to call it that, okay, the unmitigated curve. Uh, so if you look at the different cities down here, you see to varying degrees some of that. So New Orleans has a high spike, but they yet had a, so look at Birmingham, Alabama, Omaha, Nebraska. So it's a real thing, okay? It's a real thing that if we go back to work, um, we could just get right back to where we are right now. So I'm going to end there because this is a long video, but I, I'm going to do, I'll do a follow-up video where I talk about some ideas for going back to work and some of the tools that I see our government putting into place to allow us to do that. But, uh, you know, I, so takeaways here today, folks, good news, right? We're doing much better. Please don't use that to say the models are meaningless, they're wrong, and stop using the models. That is not the case, okay? You, I, I, I still find this IHME model the most useful because it's live and it's public, uh, but it's limited. I mean, even to the extent that it only provides... Oh, by the way, ventilators went from 31,000 to just under 25,000. So, again, take away from that that the things that we're doing are working. We're doing better than the model thought we could do. That is the smart takeaway from this, okay? Not the, and even if the, where the model was inaccurate, uh, we have to trust and hope that the people that are working on the model are updating it um, as we go. So, uh, good news. Um, you know, go back to work. <laughs> Nobody wants to get this economy turned back on more than Trump. Or me. I would argue with them about it, that it might be me. So, uh, you know, but, but we have to be realistic about it. So anyway, watch for my next video, and I will go through some ideas, planning for go back to work. Talk to you again. Watch for my next video, and be blessed.